Hello, my name is Judith Hawley. I'm Professor of English here at Royal Holloway. I specialise in literature and culture of what we call the long 18th century. So I begin around 1660 with the Restoration and I go through to the Romantic period around 1830. I'm going to talk today about a play by Afra Ben called The Rover. Uh, it's a very important play. It's, it's important actually that it's almost the only play by a woman from this period that survives on the academic syllabus. And it's curious to think about why it is that Afra Ben should have made it through. Why did she survive and others didn't? What is it about her play that might chime with what people are interested in now? And one of the things that I think that is significant about her is that she was a pioneer in terms of women writing for money. And you might well know Virginia Woolf said that all women together ought to let flowers fall on the grave of Afra Ben, for it was she who earned us the right to speak our minds. And there's a way in which the very fact that Afra Ben had written was supposed to entitle other women to write. Now, Virginia Woolf quite rightly added that um, because she wrote in such a kind of uh, provocative way, she actually had a negative influence on women's ability to write for the next 50 years or more. Um, she says that a daughter, this is Virginia Woolf again, a daughter could go to her mother and say, uh, you don't need to find me a husband, uh, I can earn my living by my pen. And mothers would slam the doors in their face and say, what, and live the life of Ben? Afra Ben was a very scandalous woman. So if we're introducing Afroben to students today, what are the kinds of things that we could say about her? I think that first thing about her very provocative nature, her very confrontational nature uh, is important. She was a pioneer, but she was a pioneer um, by fighting and challenging and being really very aggressively direct with the male literary establishment of the time. She also earned a living by her pen. So the fact that she wrote for money which is uh, something that's both very positive in that it means that she had some professional status. It's also a drawback in that she had to write always with the commercial interest in mind. She had to write with what would sell in mind. So she's writing very closely within a tradition of restoration comedy. So if I were teaching this text to my students, I would introduce them to what those conventions were. What are the conventions of restoration comedy? and what does Ben do with them. I would talk about the way in which most comedies written during this period after the restoration of Charles II have um, a set of stock character types that come up again and again. It's, it's rather like the types of situation comedy, I suppose. The same sorts of tropes, techniques, character types come up. And what do we have? We have, first of all, uh, the witty couple. So the young man and young woman who spend most of the play arguing with each other and being very, very clever, uh, refusing to marry each other, refusing to have anything to do with each other so that they can get together at the end. And one model for that witty couple is Beatrice and Benedict, Shakespeare's characters, Beatrice and Benedict. To act as a kind of contrast or foil to them, we have the sentimental couple. And these are the true lovers who speak only sincerely and so desire each other that all they want is to marry. They don't mind if they have any kind of fortune at all. They just want to get together. And they have to overcome the obstacles of their parents' disapproval or usually the young man's poverty in order to marry. We then have an obstacle to their love. And these obstacles usually take... Um, one of two forms. Uh, the first and uh, most sort of structurally important form, I think, is the disapproving parent. This is very often a father who um, is trying to control the fortune of his wealthy daughter or his guardian, um, and he doesn't want this guardian of, of his to marry the poverty-stricken young man. Why is the young man poverty-stricken? He's usually poverty-stricken because he was a cavalier in exile. He was a supporter of King Charles when he was in exile during the interregnum, during the Civil War years. And uh, he's returned to England hoping to make his fortune through marriage. There's one other kind of obstacle that you get, and very often this obstacle is the character who provides the name for the play. 
not always, but, but quite often, a character who's a kind of marplot, somebody who interferes, sort of accidentally, almost as a buffoon. He comes on when the hero and the heroine, the sentimental couple or the witty couple, are about to seal their love pact for each other, and he makes a mess of things. Um, and then finally you have discarded lovers, so the the witty man, who's usually a bit of a rake, a bit of a ne'er-do-well, might have other mistresses that he's abandoned on the way to marriage with the heroine. So those are the conventions that were becoming established by the time Afra Ben wrote The Rover. What does she do with these characteristics? Well, she does have a witty couple. We have Helena and we have Wilmore, the Rover. She has a sentimental couple. She has Belleville and Florinda. But then things start to get a little bit more complicated. She doesn't have a father, an authority figure, who gets in the way of the marriage. She has a brother who's trying to arrange the marriages. So the, the politics, the power relations run rather differently because this, this brother is a kind of jealous lover himself. The witty couple are also rather complicated because the, the man, Wilmore, the rover. I wonder if he's really the hero or whether he's something of a marplot. He gets in the way all the time, doesn't he? Every time Florinda and Belleville are trying to get together, he creates problems. So this makes me think that Afra Ben is, is in some ways destabilising the authority of the hero by making him something of a buffoon and the butt of the joke as well. The primary thing she does is she makes the women run the plot. So the plot of the rover is not so much about the rover, the rake, trying to have his way with the women and get, get the woman he wants, but it's the women engineering the marriage plots. They actually begin the play. So Afroben is playing with these conventions. She's asking us to think about, um, well, whose desire is the, is the engine of the plot? And I think in this case, it's the women's. Another way in which she subverts the conventions of restoration comedy is by setting the comedy not in the traditional setting of London, especially the area of London known as the town, what, what we now call the West End, which is where the theatres and the shopping districts were and still are. But she sets it in Naples during the interregnum, during the period between the reigns of Charles I and Charles II, and she sets it in carnival time. And Carnival, I think, is absolutely crucial to the way this play works. It's crucial in a couple of ways. The first is that very often the characters are in disguise. And it's very hard, I think, for um, a classroom to appreciate what's happening in the plot unless you actually put the play on its feet. I would mean, strongly recommend getting people up on their feet, script in hand, to act out certain parts of the play so you can work out who's playing what, who thinks what, and what is Helena wearing at any given time. And you think about what Helena's wearing at the end of the play. Does she return to her, her normal clothes or not? So the theme of disguise and mistaken identity and the theme of changing your identity is lived out through that setting in the carnival. The other thing the carnival gives us is the idea of the period of freedom and play before the restrictions of Lent are imposed. So this period of, of freedom and the ability to choose a husband for a woman is confined to the particular period, uh, either of carnival in, um, in, the, in the setting of this play, or uh, which it, the, the, the theme of carnival kind of symbolizes the way in which women only have a short period in which they have choice in their lives and that's the period of courtship. So courtship and carnival are kind of paralleled in this play and uh, the fun of carnival comes to an end with Lent and I think Afra Ben is suggesting that the fun of courtship comes to an end with marriage.